My name is Ken Mendoza, I'm 23 years old. Uh, I was born in Mexico, Mexico City in 1993. Uh, I came to the United States when I was six years old. Um, my mom decided to bring me to the United States because she wanted to pursue the American dream and just have a, you know, a better lifestyle and a better future for myself and my sister. Um, and uh, yeah, so you know, uh, growing up from the age of six to 13, and once already in the United States, um, there were several factors in my life that um, led, that contributed to me making decisions at an early, during my teenage years that ended up me in jail, you know, in the justice system. Uh, I had no father figure. Um, I grew up in the neighborhood where, you know, no, no father figure in my life. All my friends were undocumented. I had no father figures in life just like me, so I could relate to that. Uh, the neighborhood I grew up in, there was a lot of gang violence and the gang was really present. It was highly, you know, it was really active. Um, so I ended up, you know, those factors contributed to me, you know, when me eventually joining the gang and going into the justice system at the age of 15. Uh, I went for an 18 month uh, camp program, uh, but because I didn't get it and you know, incarceration was not serving me to help me, I was just fighting and getting into more trouble that eventually I ended up maxing out to 18 months, a year and a half. Uh, I came home when I was 17, uh, but literally within the same week of coming home, uh, you know, I committed another crime that ended me back in the justice system, and, but this time it was different, this time I was facing a life sentence. Uh, so it was, uh, those were the moments, those seven months when I was facing a life sentence and being trials as an adult. Uh, I experienced the most gloomiest moments of my life, you know. Uh, I uh, reached uh, a, a, a spiritual being, you know, I, I reached the Bible, I started reading, I started educating myself, but I was still facing a life sentence. Uh, not until um, a mentor came into my life, who is my boss now for my nonprofit that I work for, he, uh, he just started coming to visit me every weekend and at the beginning I didn't like him because you know he's white and I'm like I don't feel comfortable I'm not used to someone coming to see me because they see the potential in me or just because they just I don't know they they see something in me that I don't even see in me you know so it's not it's not normal uh, and eventually because he was there you know he instilled that 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 um, that possibility that me I could that I could probably possibly change in the future um, so after, you know, seven months of fighting this life sentence, I was one of those fortunate individuals who beat that life sentence. Uh, a lot of kids don't get to beat that life sentence. There's plenty of kids who, you know, right now that I know that who are in prison and they're my age and I was locked up with them when I was 15. So I, I'm lucky and I, was, I got blessed. Uh, that didn't mean that I didn't do no time. Now, even though I beat my life sentence, I was sent back to juvenile court. Uh, and uh, in juvenile court, I, I took a deal of seven years and a strike. Uh, you know, I just gave up. I just wanted to do my time and go home. And you know, and, and, and so I took seven years in a strike and you know, I went from juvenile hall to county jail, from county jail to the Department of Juvenile Justice in Stockton. Um, and so I, I did overall five years. Uh, the first four years I was, you know, just messing up, not really, still not really getting the, the image, not seeing the view, the, what I wanted to do in my life. You know, um, uh, but you know, in the last year of my incarceration, I decided to dedic dedicate myself to like read books, uh, uh, such as like, I, I used to love autobiographies uh, or non-fiction books. I, I read Nelson Mandela's autobiography, Malcolm X, Pancho Villa, Zapata, like those, cause I'm, I love leadership. I love real stuff. Cause you know, that's, I just, that's just what it attracts me. So and that, just reading these books and the Bible and you know, knowing that there's someone, there's a higher being and just the support system that kept me uh, in the right direction while being uh, incarcerated. Uh, and you know, I, I, got a, I went to parole board here in 2014, April uh, 9th, and, um, and I got an honorable discharge, you know, and this was a little bit surprising because most of the time when, any, any, when anybody goes to a parole board hearing, they uh, are denied the first time, you know, and they're always tell, oh, you gotta come back a year later or six months after, but I guess because I had demonstrated a transformation and and I was a leader within jail I was like a mentor to a lot of young kids uh, they saw potential and they also saw that I, I did change and, and I demonstrated through my presentation so I know but discharge next thing you know I'm in county jail unfortunately I had to face another barrier uh, and because I'm, I'm undocumented so uh, I went to immigration and in immigration um, you know I, I had the chance to one last opportunity 
and that was me trying to convince this ICE agent who has a mask, who has this attitude, you know, like that strong, like mad attitude because that's just how they are. Um, but I knew that at the end of the day, he's still a human being. He has feelings just like me. So I'm going to tell my story to him in a way that it's going to humanize him. And I did. So I told him how I used to be, how I used to think, what I used to do, what I've done, and what I would love to do if I was to get out. And you know, for some reason he felt that and he told me like, you know what, um, I, I, think, I think everything you're telling me is true and I'm gonna let you go. I just don't know, I, you, you just, you know, your story is amazing and I hope I'm not gonna make a mistake, but I'm gonna let you go. That doesn't mean that you're not gonna report to us, you still have to come back. So I still have to deal with immigration stuff after getting released. Uh, next, um, when I, I, as soon as they opened the gate, the first person I saw was my mentor, Scott Bunnick. He was right there, and I, you know, and that's you know, that's the support. You know, that's it's, it's important. You know, for for people who are, especially the kids who uh, go to juvenile hall. You know, because a lot of times they go inside broken. They never felt love and affection. You know, but when you have someone that could stick with you from the beginning to the end, even when you relapse and you disappoint them so many times because you don't get it, but he's still there. That's what matters at the end of the day. Because at least that's what mattered to me. Because he had a big impact in my life. So. You know, so I came home and um, I automatically got, started getting involved into uh, uh, community uh, service and things. I was doing, um, uh, I started doing a lot of public, uh, public speaking uh, 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 in universities, uh, campuses, uh, schools, inside juvenile halls. I started getting involved, started giving back. Uh, and um, because I started doing this right away when I came home, I really was motivated, I was dedicated, I was doing what I was supposed to do. Uh, things started open opportunities started opening up in my life you know just like when I was gang banging like I believe like there's an energy in this world that we all attract you know like and like when I was gang banging you know when I was tagging my hood when I was va vandalizing property when I was robbing people when I was getting tickets for ditching you know I would get rewarded for those actions you know and those those rewards are energy that I'm attracting for myself you know and that the, those rewards will be me being put on house service, me being sent to county jail, me being uh, facing a life sentence, you know, that's what I attracted, you know, and now that I'm home, you know, because I'm, now I mentor kids in juvenile hall, I do all great things, you know, giving back, I'm seeing the same effect, but now it's the positive one, you know, because I'm doing all these great things, now I'm, I got, I, I, I've, I've been, I've experienced things that I never thought I would experience in my life. I've been in the White House, I, I mean, I published articles for the Huffington Post, the Guardian, um, I met senators, congressmen, billionaires in New York. I, I've done so much things that I never thought I would do, but it's all because of the commitment and the education I'm doing for, for you know, for helping other people and myself. I'm a, I'm a full-time student, I'm majoring in political science and business, and um, and uh, I've been, I, I work for a, a, the anti-recidivism coalition. So basically, it's a nonprofit that helps formerly incarcerated individuals like myself re-enter get back into society successfully and keep them on the right track. Uh, I'm the member community, uh, community and member relations coordinator. Uh, and basically I'm responsible keeping all 400 of our members engaged. I coordinate the events, the trips to, uh, sometimes we do a lot of cultural trips to like Washington here, um, uh, New York, you know, so I help coordinate those trips and then our retreats. Uh, I coordinate all that. So it's just member engagement because I, I guess because I'm young, I could communicate with the members differently than a regular staff would because I'm young and I've been there, I've been in their shoes. So, and yeah, and, and, and I'm, I'm just, you know, really in, involved and I'm just trying to, you know, help change the world, you know. I want to, I want to live in this world with a purpose. I don't think no kids should be sent to anything that ha where there's adults. You know, I think if a kid commits a crime or, or whatever, keep them in juvenile hall or somewhere, but not close to county jail or prison. Why? Because once you send a kid to prison at a young age or into county jail, you're gonna expose them to a whole different world that, you know, they're gonna get sucked into. You know, there's politics in county and prisons that they have to abide to. And going at a young age, they're gonna start looking up to these gang members inside prison. They're gonna start wanting to become like them and trying to make a name for themselves. And then they might go in for eight years and might end up getting 10 more years added because they want to fit in inside prison. So I don't think nobody should be sent inside in prison. It's not good for them. It's not going to help them at all. Uh, we should keep them in juvenile hall or some institution where the point is not for punishment, but 
not for punishment, but for rehabilitative purposes, where you offer programs, school, trades, and things. So when they come home, they are ready to, to continue to be, uh, to stay on the right track, you know, and they're young, they're gonna come out young, so you have to, you have to really um, provide them all these resources because this is the critical time for them to like hit them and change them right there because if we don't get them at that time, they're gonna easily get influenced by other guys, they're gonna go the wrong, the wrong path, and we don't want that. I think first, well, first of all, I think that um, the criminal justice system and overall in the whole United States is it's a race, it's a racist system. Uh, the reason why is because if you see the people who are locked up, the majority or most of it, like 90% is, is either blacks or African American, I mean African Americans or, or Mexicans, right? Or Hispanic or, you know, people of color. Uh, and, and sometimes it's because they are, they come from communities, they are not, they don't have good schools, or if they do, they're not well funded, so the teachers don't teach with passion, uh, and so the kid doesn't feel his value, and the communities probably don't have uh, recreative centers or some type of programs or resources that they, you know, keep the kids on track, you know, so in a way, kind of like they are forced to live a certain type of lifestyle, that to the public outside of this ghetto, you know, people who live like in Beverly Hills in the rich areas, it seems like, oh, it, it's criminal. You start seeing these things as not normal and you criminalize these things, right? So I think that uh, it's racist because of that, you know, because of the fact that they are, the, the communities are not, are not well, they're not being helped. So people are getting sucked into this poverty thing, crying, and they ended up in the, ending up in the justice system. Eventually, some people go home, relapse, and some people end up homeless. So it's, um, so I think racism has a big role in the whole criminal justice system overall. Uh, and that's how, that's where it started from. That's the root of it. The root starts from the Jim Crow to mass incarceration. That's the root root. So um, the LA County Board of Supervisors, uh, Supervisor Mark Willie Thomas and Sheila Cuse, they started a, a subcommittee called the Youth Diversion Committee. And it's exactly about that. You know, it's basically a committee where uh, experts around this issue, you know, uh, from people who are formerly incarcerated to family members to the police to, you know, just people of the community who work on these issues. Uh, we meet every month, every uh, month, and talk about what are best ways to prevent. What is an alternative for instead of sending once a kid gets in trouble, to, instead of sending it to pro, uh, to camp or juvenile hall, what can serve, you know? And I think that if we could have like some type of um, recreational centers or programs in the community where people from the community work with these individuals, you know, people, even formerly incarcerated individuals that work with these kids because uh, I feel that they have a better understanding of the needs of this, this kid's need and the communication, it's different, you know, because we understand, you know, formerly incarcerated individual is going to understand someone who just got out of prison and could see what, you know, like if the, what the person really needs. Uh, so I think just, you know, programs in the, in the community, you know, just uh, after school programs, summer camp program, um, uh, just centers where people can go hang out and if people get in trouble, probably send them to a center, do a little time in the center, and the center probably might consist of, uh, you have to wake up early and go to, you have to play basketball, you have to go to boot camp, you have to, you know, go to school, like that's what, that's a jail, that's how it's supposed to be. Somewhere where you're actually getting something out of it and you're not being dehumanized and you're not losing your self-esteem and you come home and start doing bad things all over.